So a lot of the ideas that I have uh, to share with you tonight are ideas that are being uh, put forward in the fourth edition of my book, The Professional Financial Advisor, Putting Transparency and Integrity First. And the subtitle is actually very important. And so we'll, we'll go into where we're going with regulation, where we've come from, and, and, and where we are right now. There are a number of developments that are actually right upon us. And so the timing for this webinar is perfect because there are a lot of you who will be listening in today that will be getting statements in the next week or so uh, that will be, for, for many of you, the first time that you will have seen certain things and had a chance to actually go over certain things about how much your advisor and his or her firm are being paid and how you're performing. Um, those, are, those are disclosures that will be made for the first time for most people uh, in January of 2017, and as far as I know, most firms haven't gotten their statements out yet, but they will likely be out in the next uh, week or two. So I want to begin by talking about a phrase that I coined uh, long ago, which is scientific testing and necessary and interme disintermediation underpin professionalism, stand-up. Uh, the first thing is it's a catchy little sort of acronym to help people understand uh, what people um, are should be doing, what advisors should be doing to help their clients. And the image of the little man in the in the green arrow was actually standing, and the arrow was going up. He's not holding a tent up; it's actually a guy who was standing up. The the D for uh, disintermediation is important because for the first three editions of the book, I used to talk about scientific testing and necessary disclosure underpin professionalism. But as we will see later on tonight, uh, disclosure is widely seen as being insufficient to protect consumers and to help the industry move to professional status. And so what we're ultimately going to be moving to is disintermediation. And when I say disintermediation, what that means is getting rid of the link between products and advisor compensation. You break the link, you disintermediate, so that um, the only way advisors can be paid going forward will be directly from their clients and not through product provision. So for today, I'll be offering my views on regulations uh, here and from abroad. We'll go over the past, present, and, and what I think, because no one knows for sure, the future might ha uh, have to, to hold for uh, regulatory reform. We'll talk about why these things are being done and what we hope the benefits will be. And I'll put a few ideas forward in terms of not only um, where, where things are certain to be going, but also what it's likely to mean and where we might go from here. So um, there's a few quotes here that I'd, uh, I don't, I don't want to read them out to you. It's kind of boring to do that. Uh, I, I will say that the Sinclair quote is perhaps the most important uh, lens through which to view financial advice in Canada today and frankly throughout most of the world. Um, a lot of advisors don't want to acknowledge that they are biased and when you make money doing things a certain way, you're not going to uh, acknowledge that there are other ways that are almost certainly and, and quite demonstrably better. And so you continue doing things the way that you've always done them and you pretend to not get it even though uh, uh, it's funny how the advisors claim to not get it when ordinary men and women on the street, when you explain things to them, uh, understand it very, very well. So uh, from here, we'll go to um, what, how things have been moving in the past with uh, regulatory reform. And about, um, about uh, I'm going to say 10 years ago, sort of uh, after the first edition of my book and, the and be between the first and the second edition, the Ontario Securities Commission, the OSC, released an initiative that they called the Fair Dealing Model. And the idea was to disclose costs and conflicts so that uh, advisors can be um, able to deal with the problem through disclosure. And uh, as is usual, um, most industry stakeholders uh, within the securities industry, uh, but also the mutual fund industry, made a big stink over, well, you know, you're calling it the fair dealing model. Are you implying that it wasn't fair in the past? And that's really not what the OSC is doing. And, once again, they're diverting attention. Uh, the real problem, of course, is trying to ensure that everyone gets a fair deal going forward without casting any aspersions over what happened in the past. And, uh, and so that was the genesis of regulatory reform uh, sort of in, the, in modern times in, in Canada. And uh, I will also say that this is an Ontario initiative, the Ontario Securities Commission, but as most people on the call will know, Canada is really 
really the only major country in the world that, that does not have a national securities regulator. And as a result, we actually have 10 provincial um, securities commissions all of which try to get along and play nice, but as you might imagine, politics uh, gets involved. And, and, and as a result, even when one province makes an initiative, in order for it to have much uh, force and effect, you really need the other provinces to buy in. So um, to that end, what happened was over time, uh, when the OSC took the fair dealing model FDM as far as they could, they, uh, they gave it over to what they called the CSA, the Canadian Securities Administrators, which is the amalgam of the other nine, uh, Ontario plus the other nine uh, provincial securities regulators to try to come up with something that they would actually be able to roll out nationally. So what happens when you try to roll something out nationally? Well, first off, there's a lot of log rolling that goes on and things are rebranded because fair dealing was seen as being a bad name. More importantly, um, in order to get consensus, you end up having to water down uh, original ideas. and so. I worked on a working group with the fair dealing model very diligently. Every We met like every second week for like a, a, a year to put our report out uh, with regard to costs and conflicts and, and eliminating advisor compensation. And then we just gave it to the to um, the OSC to give to the, to show to the other nine provinces. And they bickered for years, literally years. And they watered it down considerably and delayed it until we could finally get something that we could actually agree on which is less, but finally in, uh, in 2012, we had something that we could uh, um, work with, and that's something called the, the client relationship model. It was the first phase, so it's, it's now uh, referred to colloquially as uh, CRM1, and it went live. And that included a number of things that are important, but not really critical. So the nature of the engagement, more suitability disclosure, make conflict of interest disclosures, you get it in a booklet, it's all nice and well, but it, it, it's really more paperwork to to say what most people would say was self-evident, that if you're dealing with a company that acts, uh, you know, principal agent status, they might be conflicted and they might be selling you securities where they're the underwriter and as a result, they, you know, you should expect that they'd be trying to make some money off it and you need to be aware of that. So those are the sorts of things that were being done in CRM1. They also said that you have to um, update accounts if you change advisors, if there's a transfer in, so if you've already got a pre-existing RSP and then the client consolidates with you and a $200,000 RSP becomes a $400,000 RSP, um, you need to do to run tests to make sure that the account is still suitable, even if it was suitable before the transfer in. You know, the other things that are transferred in could throw things off. So there's a lot of things that were done, which are they're good, but they're fairly motherhood and they're not really good getting to the root of the problem. These were the sorts of low-hanging low fruit, let's say, are the sorts of problems that were going on in the industry. So uh, examples of what else was going on. Overall risk tolerance, now you have to actually talk about risk, risk tolerance on an account by account basis instead of just being for the whole family. You've got an RSP, you've got a TFSA, you've got a, a cash account, you might have uh, other, other things. And so each account has to be accounted for in terms of its risk profile and, uh, and uh, make sure that that fits. And certain things uh, might be deemed to be speculative uh, when they when they might not really be. I I've had a bit of a an ongoing um, challenge with uh, my compliance departments, for instance, in the past as to whether or not emerging markets are um, medium risk or high risk. And and furthermore, um, there was a determination uh, around uh, CRM one that long-term bonds, even if the government of Canada bonds, are now going to be medium risk as opposed to low risk. And basically, what it what it did was it, it made the new suitability guidelines in CRM one made almost everything medium risk. If it's a speculative stock, then it's high risk, and if it's a T bill or a GIC, then it's low risk. But virtually any ETF, virtually any mutual fund, virtually any blue chip stock, and 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 short term bonds, all of that is considered to be medium risk. The definition for low risk is you can't lose money. It has to be the sort of thing that it's got to be cash or cash equivalents. Everything else, if there's even a slight chance that you might lose money, it immediately bumps up to medium risk. And uh, a lot of people will have different opinions about why that happened. My view is that um, part of it is the industry saying, oh, you know, they're, they're making themselves look out to be quite virtuous by look how we're protecting consumers. But really, I think a lot of uh, member firms, IROC member firms, MFDA member firms, 
were covering their own tails by by making everything to be at least medium risk, so that um, suitability was the sort of thing where they were effectively increasing clients' tolerance for risk by making virtually everything at least medium risk uh, on the uh, that was on the product shelf. So in the ensuing three years, we've now moved toward what I'm going to what, what I think a lot of people will be interested in today, which is the second phase of the client relationship model generally referred to as CRM2. Uh, so um, the first elements went live back in 2014. That was new disclosures for free trade commissions and the use of fund facts and in the near future uh, ETF facts. Um, and then there are more meaningful changes that are going to be coming down the pike with regard to reporting of payments made to the advisor's firm uh, and, uh, and performance reporting. Now this is where the rubber hits the road. In the next week or so, to um, people who have investment accounts at firms um, where they where the firms are offering um, custody and, and and have to do the reporting, these clients will be receiving, in most instances, for the first time ever, a statement for year end uh, based on the calendar year 2016 that will say exactly how much they paid to their advisor's firm and exactly how their their account has done on an account by account basis. It will not surprise many of the readers of Canadian Money Saver, but let me tell you a few of the dirty little secrets of the advice industry. First off, the readers of Money Saver get it. They're smart, most of them are, are cost sensitive, and most of them are self-directed and are do-it-yourselfers because they don't even need advice because they're smart enough and they don't, they don't need it. Wonderful. Um, it may come as a surprise to some of you, but there are hundreds of thousands and perhaps even a few million Canadians who to this day have no clue, none, about how or how much their advisor gets paid, and about half of them um, have, have, can't give you a sense at all of how much, and about a quarter of them actually think financial advice is free. Now, I don't know of any other line of work, maybe unless you're you know, a member of the clergy or you know, you've decided to, to join like a convent or, a, or something like that, I don't know who else would work for free, but somehow there's a constituency in Canada numbering probably in, into seven digits, probably over a million people in Canada who think financial advice is free simply because they have never received an express bill that they have to pay. So they will be getting uh, statements in the next week or two about how much they've paid their advisor's firm. And the feces is going to hit the proverbial fan. There are some people, and, and by the way, uh, there's culpability to go all around. Um, there are a lot of advisors who um, do try very diligently to explain to their clients how and how much they're getting paid, and some clients just can't hear or won't hear or don't get it. But there are also a number of advisors who you know, play the game by saying, well, it doesn't cost you anything because the clients aren't getting a bill. And there are a lot of clients, conversely, that are willfully ignorant, that, that are, are saying, well, if you, know, if you ask me no questions, uh, I'll tell you no lies. And there's a lot of people who, if they don't ask, you know, don't ask, don't tell sort of falsy. If you don't ask your advisor how much you're paying them, then maybe that means you're not paying them uh, and, uh, because you've never seen a bill. So that is going to be a very big deal. I don't think the performance reporting is going to be a big deal when people get those statements in a week or two because um, a lot of them will only be for the calendar year. Some, some firms will report going back one, three, five years and since inception, but many will only report for one year. And since 2016 was a reasonably good year in capital markets, I don't expect that there will be a significant hue and cry. And frankly, even if we go back three years or five years, you're not going to have a big problem. Obviously, the problem for people when they see uh, the scary numbers are if you go back to before the meltdown of 08, 09, which is less than 10 years ago, if you see those sorts of numbers, you're, 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 a lot of people are still just getting back to where they were eight or nine years ago, and uh, a lot of people will be shocked to, to know that. So again, a few things that were implemented. Um, again, the things that were implemented a couple years ago, relatively basic things, uh, changes in mass market calculations, statements including position costs. There's a real pain. A lot of the people in the advisory industry were annoyed that uh, if you transferred uh, securities or um, funds or ETFs from one firm to another, you lost the ACB information. You didn't know what the adjusted cost base was, and it was a real 
problem for tax reporting in terms of capital gains and capital losses when you traded in the taxable account after the transfer in. So they've got some consistency with regard to that. Um, last year, again, CRM2, the reporting, actually went live on July 15th of 2016. The firms have one year to comply, and the very, very vast majority of firms have decided that they will comply using year-end data, and therefore that's why most people will be seeing this stuff for the first time when they get their December 31st statements in the next week or two. Um, full compensation disclosure, and this is another thing that a lot of uh, people don't realize. When an advisor gets paid, the advisor doesn't keep 100% of the money. The firm is going to take a pound of flesh. Um, some firms take 70 or 80% of the money and have the advisor pay his or her own costs, staff, rent, what have you. Other firms will take a smaller percentage, uh, will pay the advisor, say, 50%, but cover those costs for uh, for the uh, for the advisor, and uh, a lot of the amount of uh, payment depends on the amount of production. Um, so the payout rate, which is the amount that the advisor is paid, uh, is not disclosed in the statement, and therefore um, it, it could also create a problem with regard to people thinking advisors are actually being paid more than they actually are. Most advisors are being paid when you when you back out, even the ones that are getting 70 and 80 percent, when you back out their expenses. They're probably taking home about you know, 55 or 60 at the very high end, 62 or 63 percent of what they're making um, of their gross production, and um, and then it's still a big number. If you're doing a million dollars of revenue, you're still making over 600 thousand dollars a year. Um, at the other firms, uh, if you're at a bank-owned firm, you might be being paid 40 or 45 percent, and a million dollars might allow you to keep 400 or 450. But again. Not everyone's making a million dollars, but you know, don't feel sorry for advisors. They're being well paid. Thank you very much. Um, so there's a follow-up that I think is coming, and and I when I talk about the one that is coming, um, I also want to talk about the one that I think uh, is coming, but further down the road because there are certain things where CRM2 is, to my mind, almost willfully negligent in not dealing with some of the bigger problems. So let's speculate about what's going to happen. Uh, I'm just going to say this is what I'd like to see, and this is what I think is going to happen. Uh, first off, we're not done. Uh, all the regulatory reforms that are being implemented right now, we're still very much in the middle of a number of reforms that need to be done, and and that includes the elimination of embedded compensation and uh, the introduction of a statutory best interest standard. So when I talk about what's not being done and what's not being disclosed on these statements in CRM2, they talk about how much the advisor's firm is being paid. There's no disclosure, none, uh, in a similar sort of format that talks about how much your products cost. So imagine this. If you're going to a garage and you need to have your carburetor replaced, I don't know, um, if you want to get an estimate, the, before you have any work done, the person at the garage will likely say it's going to cost uh, $500 for the carburetor and it's going to cost three hours of labor at $80 an hour, which is another $240 for a grand total of $740 plus, uh, plus HST. And, and you, can underst you will understand what it's going to cost, you will understand what the components are, and you can initial before the work is done, and only after you've initialed will they proceed with the work. Well, what's been going on in the financial services industry forever is that there's no disclosure other than the prospectus or a fund fax, for instance, about what, what a mutual fund costs. And no one reads the old prospectuses. No one's ever read them. No one's in the, and the, and the like the eight people in the entire country that have ever read them didn't understand them. So it, the disclosure that was being done previously was essentially useless, which is one of the reasons why we have to move from disclosure to disintermediation. The problem now is, and I think this is willful on the part of high-cost product manufacturers is that through CRM2, the heat is going, to be putting on, is going to be put onto the advisors, and advisors are going to have to explain to their clients how and how much they're being paid. But these same clients who are often paying way, way more than what they're paying to the advisor, they're paying more than that to their product suppliers, but that's not being disclosed on their statements that they're getting in the next week or two. And surprise, surprise, as a result, clients probably won't ask about that. And so, Whoever heard of going to a garage and, and having the, uh, the, the, uh, the mechanic tell you, this is how much my labor is going to cost, but I'm not going to tell you how much the, cards, the, co the, the parts cost. I mean, ultimately, you're going to see the bill. But with, with things like mutual funds and ETFs, sometimes 
you never really see the bill. And so there's a problem there. And uh, one of the other things that has happened only in the past week, and I submitted something to Lana just uh, I think on Friday, about uh, one day of this week about this, is that last week on, uh, I think it was Tuesday of last week, I think it was the 10th, um, the Canadian Securities Administrators released another paper, yet another paper, discussing how to go about eliminating embedded compensation, trailing commission. And please, if anybody ever talks about these things being trailer fees, um, give, give your head a shake. They're commissions. Calling them a fee doesn't make them a fee. They're commissions. It's, please check a dictionary. So what the industry is now looking at doing, and it's only taken 22 years, Gloriane Stromberg released a, Gloriane is a, a former commissioner of the OSB, and she released a report, a report in January of 1995, 22 years ago this month, saying we think we should eliminate embedded commissions. And 22 years later, the same, the, the, the Canadian Securities Administrators put out a new paper saying, yeah, we think we should. Um, can people please give us some ideas as to how to do it? 22 years uh, have, have gone between we think we should do it to, yeah, we're going to do it, tell us how. Um, that's not urgency. That's not anything uh, like urgency. And what's amazing to me, uh, and I really think our regulators should be ashamed, is that they talk about how they're trying to protect consumers and then they dither and they don't act expeditiously and consumers are hurt in the interim. So obviously, here's a story that I like to tell. Let's say that you're out on the front porch one nice summer day with your 15-month-old toddler and you, the phone rings, so you run inside, you get the phone, and one minute later you come out and you can't find your toddler. How long would you wait before you try to find the toddler? Would you wait 22 years? <laughs> no, most people wouldn't wait 22 seconds. It's the sort of thing where it's, it's ridiculous. But um, regulators have said this is important, but then they haven't acted in a, in, a, in, a really, in a way that actually demonstrates that they actually think this is important. And the way that I would really make this point is regulators, to their credit, have said in the paper that was released nine days ago that they want to make evidence-based policy. They want to make policies based on things that are demonstrable, that can be shown and proven. And um, the problem that we have here is that um, the things that have been shown and proven in the evidence that they thought in reports that came out in 2015 would have been shown and proven if they would have commissioned those research papers 20 years earlier. My point to my, my question to them would be, if you wanted to make evidence-based policy, why did you wait 20 years before you decided to collect the evidence? So it's embarrassing, uh, in my opinion. I, I don't think regulators have much shame, but they, they should be ashamed. So there's a lot of uh, opinions about what these reforms are going to mean, and I don't think the, um, the, the, the two things that are coming out of and by themselves will be a really big deal. What I think is going to become important and where I think a lot of clients will be asking tough questions and, and possibly leaving their advisors is the interplay. Um, so the phrase that I always like to use is price is what you pay, value is what you get. Let me repeat that. Price is what you pay, value is what you get. And a lot of people will say, I think I'm getting good value from my advisor. But a lot of those same people think they're paying nothing. <laughs> So once you find out what you're paying, now let's go back and find out whether or not what you're paying actually constitutes good value. And I think at that point, um, people will will maybe have a, a little bit of a different view. So I think a lot of advisors will be um, have they'll, they'll sort of do like uh, like uh, they'll do like Ricky Arnaz. they will be Lucy, you got some explaining to do. I think there's a lot of advisors that are going to have a lot that they're going to have to explain. I should mention that. The reforms that we're doing here in Canada are not particularly new. Other jurisdictions have done similar things. Australia and the United Kingdom have banned embedded compensation already. Um, other jurisdictions are moving closer with regard to a, a best interest standard. The U.S. has actually got some um, best interest rules that are going live uh, this spring for a number, but not all of the advisors for retirement accounts. And uh, a lot of jurisdictions have moved to increase their proficiency requirements for advisors as well. So a lot of things are being done elsewhere. And this is actually something that I think is really good because 
as I talk about in the book, and part of why I, every time there's a regulatory reform, I update the book. And uh, it's good because the industry has been moving slowly but inexorably toward professional status. Um, when I started in the business 23 years ago, most advisors were really not much different from bona fide sales representatives. And we've come a long way. And, and you know, I want to give credit where it's due. There's a lot to be done, but we have at least come a long way. And uh, to my mind, even though we've come a long way, to my mind, we could have gone further and we could have certainly done it much sooner. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll offer a bit of praise, but it's a bit tepid. What happened in other countries, and I, and, and I think it's important to look at what happened in other countries because it might give us a sense of what's going to happen here in, in Canada. So in the United Kingdom, for instance, the advisor population dropped by about 25% when these reforms were enacted. But the thing is, the, the, the reforms in the UK had two prongs to them. They significantly enhanced the proficiency requirements while simultaneously removing embedded compensation. So they did those two things simultaneously, and the question is, uh, which is the chicken and which is the egg? Because 25% of the, the advisor population dropped, but maybe it was 24% because of one and 1% of the, and because of the other. Um, there are a lot of people in the industry uh, who are defenders of the status quo who will say, well, we can't bear to have a 25% advisor population drop in Canada. It's a really, really red herring. I, I find it offensive. Um, I can go into why, but it's a bit beyond the purview of, of this, uh, this call. Um, but um, I, I think that that number is not likely to be anywhere near as high in Canada because I think the, a, a large portion of the advisors that left the industry in the UK left because they simply were too dumb to pass the exam. And since there are no such reforms uh, like that going on in Canada, I think in Canada we've had, well, on the MFDA side, on the mutual fund side, I think the proficiency standards are still really low. Um, but remember that correlation is not causation. So um, the story, the little joke that I like to tell is that married people are happier than singles. Does that mean that getting married makes you happier? Well, maybe, but it might mean that some people are just so crotchety that no one will marry them. And, and you don't really realize, well, so which came first? And, and a lot of things where we look at the, the decline in the advisor population, which I think is going to happen, but I think the decline in the advisor population will be double digits, but low double digits in Canada. And by the way, it's going to be the, the worst advisors that are be, going to be gone. And I don't believe that will create any kind of a gap because virtually every advisor I've ever met is taking new clients. And if 10 or 15% of the advisors left the business, virtually every advisor I know could easily absorb 10 or 15% more clients. So matters for consideration. Do we need to improve proficiency in Canada? I think we should, especially on the NFDA side, but truth be told, that is not on the regulator's radar at all. What will happen to small investors, let's say people who have under $100,000 of net liquid investable assets? Well, um, it, there's no doubt that the IROC firms, the securities firms, have already said sayonara to accounts under 100. In fact, most IROC firms won't take people below uh, a quarter of a million, and there are some that I'm now hearing stories of they won't take anyone with less than a half a million dollars. But remember that there are, depending on who you talk to, between 100,000 and 140,000 financial advisors in Canada. And part of why we don't know the exact number is because there's dual licensing. So you can be licensed for securities or mutual funds or insurance. And people like me, I'm licensed for securities and insurance. So I'm counted as an insurance advisor and I'm counted as a securities advisor, but there's only one of me. And by the way, I can also sell mutual funds through the Anyway, what you get with is you don't really have a firm, definitive number on the number of advisors in Canada, but suffice it to say that there's about uh, about 10,000 that work in the securities industry where the standards are much higher in terms of proficiency, but also in terms of account sizes. But there's still going to be at least 90,000 advisors that are working at a bank uh, or um, through insurance or using mutual funds, and the minimum account sizes for most of those firms. Uh, don't exist. Uh, you, the, so I don't think small investors will have any trouble finding an advisor. But even if they did, um, again, price is what you pay, value is what you get. Some people will actually leave their advisors and become do-it-yourselfers. And they will do it not because they can't afford the advice, but because they've decided that it's not worth it. So transparency 
of and by itself doesn't change the quantum of compensation. What it does is instead of creating an advice gap, what it does is it, in my opinion, exposes a value gap. So to be clear, it's not that people can't afford to pay or that they can't get advice. They can, but there are a number of people, some segment, I don't know, five, you know, four or five percent of the population who will say, you know what, if I got to pay this much for lousy advice, I'd just as soon do it myself and pocket the difference. And so there are some people who will leave the advice channel and do it on their own, but they will not leave because of affordability. They will leave because the value proposition, now that they fully understand what they're paying, is no longer compelling to them. Um, of course, the other thing that I should mention is that there are robo-advisors, and there's now uh, another option, which is a low to mid-tier option for most people, where you can get some rudimentary uh, planning and algorithmic uh, portfolio construction and rebalancing and some tax loss harvesting and a lot of really good things using low-cost products that uh, if you're a small investor, um, irrespective of however old you are, um, you might be better off doing it that way as well. So now we can get into things like, well, one of the problems that we don't talk about in Canada is how much does this product cost and how material is the difference in product cost? And I guess the question that it really begs is, will that be important in the future? And I can tell you that in the UK, when they banned embedded compensation, there was a massive, massive shift for advisors, now that advisors had to charge their clients separately, from high-cost products to low-cost products. But right now, the products that pay, advi pay advisors and embedded compensation are also the highest-cost products. And therefore, there is no incentive for advisors who want to earn their money via trailing commissions to recommend low-cost products. There's a saying, I, I like to call um, high-cost embedded compensation mutual funds uh, inferior mousetraps. And the point that I would always make is, what's one thing that you can count on when you're dealing with an inferior mousetrap salesman? And the answer is, that salesman will never ever tell you about the existence of a better mousetrap. If you make your business selling inferior mousetraps, and you make your living doing that, you're not going to tell people that better mousetraps exist. If you can no longer uh, earn a living by, by commission selling inferior mousetraps, and you have to charge the client directly, you may as well sell them the better mousetrap. So it's going to start happening, but um, I think the time horizon, the, the paper on, on, on uh, tell us how to go about eliminating embedded compensation is available for comment until June 9th. Um, regulators have said that they would like to um, digest all the comments they've received by June 9th and, and come out with a, a way forward by hopefully best case year end. Realistically, I think we're looking at a year from now before we're even told how we're going to go about eliminating embedded compensation. And again, being told how is not the same as actually eliminating. That could still take a number of years after that. So we've still got a long way to go. And there are a lot of other things where disclosure is just not cutting it. It's, it's, it's not really protecting investors. Uh, and there's no real informed consent, which is why we have to go to the next phase of actually eliminating embedded compensation. So let's talk a moment about what I call the ABCs of investing. And for those of you who have heard me speak before, you may have seen uh, the next few slides already, but I think it's worth repeating. A is for alpha, which is what other people will call outperformance. B is for beta, which is the risk of the market. And C is for cost. And when you start thinking about uh, investing, uh, a lot of the decisions that people have to make are the, uh, are the ABCs, the interplay between alpha, beta, and cost. So I like to show people two simple options. Here's option A for alpha. Let's assume the stock market does um, 8% in, in a given year. And you've, you're looking at the universe of different products that you could invest in. These are uh, embedded compensation products without advisor compensation. So let's call them F-class mutual funds. The average cost for a product like that might be about 1.5%. So the average return from the universe of these products is going to be the return of the market minus the average cost of the product. If the market does 8, the product costs 1.5. The average return is 6.5. What you then get is that's your, that's your break even. The average mutual fund investor will get 6.5% when the market does 8. That's because the market has no MER, but mutual funds do have an MER. And there's a wide dispersion of Alpha, which is the right side, the, the you know, one standard deviation is the 10.75, and two standard deviations, let's say, is 15%. But there's also the negative alpha, 
which is the uh, the return substantially below that on the left. And when you listen to active managers talking about what they're planning to do and what they're doing, um, they all talk about the right side. But what you need to understand is for every person on the right side of that graph, there is another manager on the left side, as it must be, because the average must be the return of the market minus cost. Contrast that with what I'm going to call option B, which is beta. Same market, same 8% total return, but the beta option might cost, say, one half of 1%, with a standard deviation of, let's say, one half of 1%. So the only reason there's any variance at all is because some products do a better job than others of tracking a benchmark. But if the, the benchmark does eight and the product costs one half on average, then your return is going to be um, 0.75 on average. So the question that you have to ask yourself is, um, what's, what's the better option for clients? And all I know is that when I tell people that you have an option between a 6.5% expected return with a wide variance and a 7.5% expected return with a narrow variance, the very large majority of people say, I choose option B. And if that's true, and advisors are such good communicators, why is about 95% of all mutual fund money in Canada invested in products that use strategies as are depicted in option A? And again, the problem is embedded compensation. So there's a real problem here. So the, pro, the pros and cons of the two options is A gives you a, a statistically stronger probability of a high return, uh, uh, but it also is trying to um, um, pursue the positive outlier, the, the positive outlier for um, for B. I think I got that. I think I wrote that down wrong. So it's the other way around. I, I got them reversed. So actually, option A is is pursuing the positive outlier, and B is the pursuit of, of the um, uh, statistically stronger probability. Forgive me, please. There's a paper that was written by Bill Sharp. If anybody here on the call um, wants a copy of the paper, I've got it in PDF form. Please send me an email uh, tonight or tomorrow. My email address is john.degui at iagto.ca, which is on the front uh, slide. Um, it's a two and a half, it's a two page paper written by Bill Sharp. Bill Sharp, uh, and, and it was written um, 30, <laughs> what, what is that now? Nine plus that. Nine plus 26, 27, 28 years ago. And um, it basically says what I just said a moment ago that all markets are nothing more than the sum of all active and passive managers. And, and if the average passive manager gets you the return of the market minus cost, it logically follows that the return of the average active manager is the return of the market minus cost. And since the average passive manager costs less than the average active manager, it stands to reason and it logically follows as the night falls day that the average passive manager must, must outperform the average active manager. And that's the sort of information that most advisors don't share with clients. Uh, it's getting through. As you um, may know, there's been a massive shift uh, from uh, high cost alpha seeking products to low cost beta replicating products in the past little while. And that trend is accelerating. So the message is finally getting through. And it's getting through, I think, because there are some good product suppliers. And I, it needs to be said, a few good advisors, and I hope that I, you would consider me one of them, that actually tells the story over and over and over again until people finally come to get it. And again, I don't think the 69 people on this call uh, are really learning that much. They, I think most of the people on this call know most of these things. I can assure you most Canadians still don't know this. So a lot of what I talk about is in the book is scientific testing. And in fact, that's the SP from stand-up is scientific testing. There's a whole bunch of evidence that, that a lot of people are just not aware of and that a lot of advisors willfully choose not to disclose. And the question that I guess it begs is how professional is it to willfully not disclose, disclose material information that will assist a client in making an informed decision? In fact, there's some evidence that a lot of disclosure doesn't even work. And even if disclosure were to work in helping explain um, things for clients, it does not do anything to deal with the advisor bias that's caused by embedded compensation. Um, another paper that I'm quite fond of is a paper that also came out, uh, uh, in this case, uh, 20 years ago from Mark Carhart. And uh, you know how virtually every mutual fund perspective says uh, past performance may not be repeated and, you can't rely on it and so forth. Well, there's a reason for that, and that's because it can't be. And Carhartt showed this with rigor 20 years ago, 
and yet um, most advisors that I know, at least on the NFBA side, are still making more recommendations to clients based on past performance than they are based on product cost, even though the evidence is irrefutable. That cost is a much more reliable predictor of future performance. It's much more salient uh, than, than is uh, past performance but somehow advisors don't seem to want to do that. It's gotten so bad that, and it's funny because I'm having coffee with uh, a principal from uh, Morningstar tomorrow morning. Morningstar has actually gone so far as to say, look, if, you, if you've got to choose funds, don't choose funds based on our star rankings. Choose funds based on cost, and cost correlates negatively. So the lower cost products are the best ones. Um, it's amazing that even Morningstar is doing that. Morningstar has also um, done the right thing, and they're now um, not even uh, giving out awards anymore for past performance because it's random and it doesn't doesn't uh, persist. So we have a situation now where there are knowledge asymmetries and disclosure of and by itself. Uh, I think it's good if we had more disclosure, but I think, as I say in the end, I think we're moving toward uh, disintermediation. In fact, uh, Kane and Saw at Georgetown have, uh, have shown that um, it doesn't always work the way you expect, and in fact, uh, some advisors at uh, firms where you where you disclose that you've got a proprietary product for them, and it costs more, and the advisor and his or her firm make more money, they've shown with rigor that clients are more likely to invest with a high-cost product. They see it as, as, as asking for a favor instead of looking out for their own best interest. So now, it's, it's now obvious that disclosure of and by itself, not only does it not help the good guys, the, the consumers, it actually sometimes helps the bad guys get what they want because it actually incentivizes consumers to use to make choices that are contrary to their own best interests. Shocking. So there's more there's more information from Kane and Saw. I don't want to um, belabor those things, but the evidence is uh, pretty overwhelming. Um, of course, we could do more if we wanted to disclose. If you wanted to talk about what we could be doing to really make disclosure salient, cigarette industry has done a good job of helping people to understand that there are risks associated with their products. Why doesn't the mutual fund industry do something similar? And there are a lot of problems that we have with regard to behavioral finance. One thing that I like to use is overconfidence. Everyone thinks that they're um, really, really good. They think they're an above average driver. They think they're above average advisors. People who are clients and investors, they think they're above average investors. Here's one thing I can say. I've been a financial advisor for over 23 years. I've met many, many active managers and I've never, ever, ever met one who admits to being below average. Yet, as we saw from those slides a few, uh, a few moments ago, by definition, half of them are b below average before cost. And because mutual funds have costs and benchmarks don't, benchmarks don't, it means that the very large majority of them are actually below average. It's not, well, not 50%, but it's actually, as the time horizon extends, it's much, much more. As you start going to, say, 10 years, it's only about 10 or 15% of, uh, of active managers that are being their benchmarks after fees. And it gets worse. If you go to 25 or 30 or 50 years, because a lot of investors actually have a 50-year time horizon, the odds are about 2% that, that an active manager will beat its benchmark. And then it gets worse still, because the average investor will have, say, six mutual funds in his, in his portfolio, each of those six funds will have a 2% chance of beating its benchmark over the lifetime of that investor's investment time horizon. So the odds of the total portfolio beating the benchmark, round to zero. It's less than one half of 1%. So it's, uh, it's pretty scary. And um, I'm just missing Jeopardy right now. We're just going to be going through final Jeopardy. Alex is going to be asking his questions. But the, uh, the question that I always like to, to, to show people is we can't all be great. By, by definition, half of us are going to be below average. So think of Jeopardy. If you, how do you guarantee that, that two of the three contestants on Jeopardy, both with a 130 IQ, lose? How do you guarantee it? And the answer is make sure all, 30, all three contestants have a 130 IQ. And you can ask the same question in reverse. How do you guarantee that someone with a 95 IQ wins at Jeopardy? And the answer is make sure all three contestants have a 95 IQ. You don't make money in the stock market by being smart. You have to be able to outperform, and outperform means you have to be smarter than everyone else. And when everyone else is brilliant, it's really hard to be consistently above average net of fees. So that's the question that I like to ask people somewhat um, um, rhetorically. 
and I like to, these are questions, by the way, that I also like to ask advisors. I'm giving a talk in Ottawa at a conference for, fi for financial planners uh, at, in May, and these are questions that I'm going to be asking them, and oh boy, they're going to love me. So, disclaimer and disclose. Um, there's a lot that can and should be done here, and um, here we go. So, I'll, I'll begin with my disclaimer, um, since I'm talking about disclaiming. Nowhere does it say that you have to have your last slide as your disclaimer. So I'm simply putting my disclaimer in the middle to make the point that you have to disclaim, but you don't have to disclaim in the, at the last slide. And uh, it should be short and easy to read and easy to understand. And so there's my disclaimer. So there's a lot of things that people should be learning about. And I don't know if there's going to be any kind of regulation about this in the future either. But there are a lot of books that show that um, there's a great deal of um, um, a great deal of information in something called behavioral finance, uh, overconfidence, which we talked about, anchoring, loss aversion, compartmentalization, um, just a whole bunch of things that a lot of people don't realize that they have their own little funky ways of thinking of things. And um, there's a lot that can be done to make things better. I think the embedded compensation fight is going to be the, the last frontier for the bad guys in the industry and I think it's going to take uh, two to six years to be played out fully. Uh, but there's a senior executive from Vanguard who said about three years ago that in his opinion within 10 years, and again remember this was three or four years ago, within 10 years there would be no more embedded compensation anywhere on the planet. So Canada, uh, if you think that we're moving quickly, we will ultimately, in my opinion, be among the last people to actually move toward um, getting rid of embedded compensation. So the things that regulators could be helping people to do and the things that I'm going to encourage you to do is when you build your portfolios, be mindful of costs and risks, diversify within and throughout asset classes, minimize your costs and, 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 and your trading costs so as to minimize tax impacts and capital gains. Warren Buffett doesn't trade very much. By the way, Warren Buffett also doesn't pay dividends through uh, through um, Berkshire Hathaway, he'd rather not pay a dividend and, and let people trigger a capital gain if they sell the stock. But if you don't pay a dividend, you don't have to pay a dividend tax. So it's, it's interesting how some smart people do certain things and a lot of other investors think dividends are the greatest thing, but only if you really need the income. Um, make reasonable assumptions. I could go on for a long time. Regulators, I don't think, are doing anything to regulate the financial planning assumptions that, that people use. One story that I can tell you is that um, I've written a couple of articles about this in uh, another publication. I don't want to name them since I'm doing this talk here for, uh, for Canadian Money Saver about the assumptions that people use. Most people are using assumptions that are way too high, but I can tell you because I've been involved for many, many years with the Financial Planning Standards Council, the FPSD um, makes it very clear in their, in their best practices and in their handbook to certified financial planners across Canada that they have uh, recommended assumed rates of return for asset classes and then they recommend as a, as, a, as a best practice to reduce those numbers by the cost of the advice and the cost of the product. And I can probably count on one hand the number of advisors that I know in Canada that actually do that. The returns going forward are going to be frightening and that's why I say I think right now there may not be a big problem with the CRM2 statements that are going out in the next week or two because returns last year were good. But when returns start to get mild and tepid and in some cases ultimately negative, I think there will be a lot more um, pointed discussions between clients and advisors. So you know how I said a few moments ago that um, there's this, uh, this, this discussion between whether or not um, trailers are commissions or fees. And I think this is really just a um, uh, an ongoing sort of shell game that the, the bad people in the industry, the uh, the representatives of the, the apologists for the mutual fund industry, they figure that if you call something a fee long enough, that society will think of it as being a, a fee. I've just spent a, a, a number of emails just this past week with Sylvia Stead of the Globe and Mail and Rob Carrick of the Globe and Mail, telling them again, because there are a number of articles written in that publication and in others, where they frequently and consistently refer to trailers as fees but in fact they are commissions. And uh, it's easy to think of it. If you've got a product orientation, you're a sales representative and, and sales representatives are in commissions. And if you are 
inclined toward giving advice and you, you're trying to offer solutions for your clients, then you're a professional and professionals charge fees. So a lot of people in the industry are product oriented and they sell things and they get commissions, but they don't want their clients to think of them as sales representatives. So they, they use the nomenclature of the professions and they say that they earn a fee and the media is complicit and they play along and then we wonder why clients don't understand how and how much advisors are being paid. So we need to be, we need to, we need to have more truth in the way we talk about things. Um, I think there's a lot that can be done where clients can win. And the good news that I have for you today is finally, finally, things are changing for the better. And dogmatism is being diminished. People are looking at actual evidence and the, the biases that are baked into the system are being eradicated. And so it's really, really good news. So the, the regulators have been really slow to do this, but I suppose at the end of the day, we should at least be thankful that they're doing something and they are doing the right thing and they are doing it purposefully. It's just that they're doing it ridiculously slowly. So my advice to you is focus on what you can control, um, your costs, uh, your trading activity, your asset allocation, your tax, and do all those things whether the regulation demands it or not. Uh, I can tell you that I personally as an advisor do not take responsibility for picking stocks or picking funds or timing markets. I don't believe I can do those things reliably and with respect. I don't believe you can or other advisors can or anyone with the possible exception of Peter Hudson who's done a really great job <laughs> last time I saw him on market call can do it either. So focus more on product and less on uh, less on product and more on process, and uh, and stand up. Uh, I'm telling people all the time: uh, scientific testing, necessary disintermediation, underpin professionalism. Those are my once again for those of you who didn't have it. Um, the first uh, thing that you see there is my email address. The second thing is my website, and the third is my Twitter handle. If, uh, if there is anyone here watching along and listening along that uh, uses Twitter. Um, please follow me. And with that, I think I am done. Thank you very much.